We still need so it. So our plan now is to go through a couple of the exercises as a demo, and then we'll answer some of the interesting questions from HackMD. So should we begin? Yeah. OK, so let's see. We've got exercise here. Yes, yeah, so um, let's look at the exercise one first, where we are supposed to run this host name uh, command. So what you want to do is write an, some uh, script with an sh at the end. So that is typical for the slurm like shell scripts. Uh, one extent like ending that we also use is the slrm for slurm script. But basically in this script, you will want to write the shebang. So the interpreter, what, what needs to be done and the actual program that you need to run. But uh, in order to run it in the queue, you also need to give the resource uh, requirements. So let's use the s batch time statement to give a time uh, value. So Richard here is using this uh, hour, minutes, uh, seconds uh, type of a mm -hmm. uh, time format, and then uh, specifying the memory with mem instead of memory, because otherwise it oh. won't work. Oh, yes. This is... There we go. Okay. But it, it, all of these can be found on a reference page. If if you yeah. Slurm will give you an error or it won't uh, mm -hmm. read the comment if it's written in some other form. Yeah. So let's try running this. OK. Uh, Control X, save. There we go. Should I submit it? And with S batch, let's submit it. So we'll see that, OK, it ran fast. So we have this fast. job ID. And the output should be, yeah, if we look at the history. So yeah, we, we see go. that in the last 10 minutes, Richard has run this serial one job. So if we look at the output, it's by default written in this Slurm and the job ID yeah, there we uh, go. file. And if we look at what's inside of it, you see that there's the uh, host name of the uh, well of the mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we could. Uh, well, I think the second and well the other other steps are not necessarily something that we necessarily need to do because that's basically like they are uh, yeah. like the output file name and the job name. You can do them with the J and uh, J mm -hmm. or the job name and the output flags. And right. uh, you can monitor the queue interactively with the Slurm watch queue. Uh, Control C will quit from that. So uh, you will have to, in, like, it will constantly keep it open. So if you're running some job and you want to see whether it's submitted, you should use this Slurm watch queue. Uh, yeah. yeah. Control C uh, exits it. Okay. Let's let's try the second script. So okay. so in this script we have a bit more like we use another program mm, to to uh, to do the analysis. So we we don't use the host name. We use the Python program uh, to to run the actual Python okay. code. So yeah. let's look at the SPC examples. Uh, yeah. Python. Try. Should I open yeah. the file or? Um, you should hmm. probably check the path. What is the path of the pi file? Um, yeah, there. Mm -hmm. it's over there. So let's let's uh, open our um, editor and uh, let's create a script for this uh, this uh, Python file that calculates the pi. Uh, let's use SH. an SH. Yeah. yeah. So so we are using Bash to launch Python. So basically, we are putting uh, stuff there. So so over here, we say to the script that you will want to launch this uh, HPC examples to learn Py, uh, Python uh, thing. And like mentioned in the example or the exercise, we should try uh, with greater number of tries with multiple S runs. Mm -hmm. 
So let's try it out. Okay. Uh, and then <clears throat> let's put some requirements there. So let's say we want to run it for, I don't know. Yeah, let's put first the uh, requirements, yeah. Yeah. Like that. And let's maybe. put something like uh, S batch time, I don't know, 15 minutes. Okay. And then maybe a few gigabytes of memory, so that just like two gigs. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then let's see what happens. So now we can see it's running uh, and we can watch it. So yeah, this watch will automatically update every, well, we can see from the time. So now it's five seconds. I think it's something like 15 seconds or something. How often does it mm. update? Okay, okay. it's, it's already finished. Control C to exit. Yeah, let's look at the output. Okay. Uh... So now it will be so called Slurm yeah. 50481. Uh, yes. OK. Yes. So here we see that the uh, script is increasingly better with, with, with increasing uh, a number of iterations. Let's check mm -hmm. Slurm history to see what, what happens. So now we see the second part. Uh, the second part with the serial 2 pi, we see that there's ma many of these uh, steps. So there's 0, 1, and 2. So these are the individual steps uh, that, uh, that we run. run. And uh, you will see that the run times are different on the right side. You will see that the first one took uh, 54 uh, milliseconds, uh, second one 68, and the third one was already 4 seconds. Mm -hmm. So heavy calculating here. But uh, oh. basically, we can monitor individual top steps uh, and individual top step uh, runtimes and mm -hmm. requirements by using the SRUN statement. Mm -hmm. So uh, these SRUN should be used, like, like mentioned before, they should be used when you're running some actual calculation code. You shouldn't like for every every command you run, you shouldn't run the S run, but only for those that are actually doing some calculation. Uh, and this brings us to to one of the questions that was in the HackMD that was really important: that that can you run anything in this uh, uh, Slurm script? And the answer is basically yes, you can run anything that you would run interactively, and that's the basically the idea of the serial script. So if you have a non-interactive uh, session where you basically, um, let's say you, you load some module, uh, you run some code, you run some other code, you go to a different folder, you run a pre-processing step, you run a post-processing step, whatever. You have uh, many different things in your workflow. This serial job basically codifies your workflow. So these indiv individual steps that you're taking, uh, they are then taken by the computer in your place. So basically, if your workflow is uh, such that, uh, let's say you, you need to uh, determine yourself with your own eyes that which plot is the correct one, uh, mm -hmm. like you have a, you do a plotting stage and the plotting stage is uh, determined by you, uh, like looking at the graph itself and okay, do this analysis or something. That's not something that computer can replicate because you are like in a major part in that workflow. But if your workflow is written in a way where you the computer can calculate, let's say, uh, a value that it can use to determine which plot to choose, it can uh, it can do the these certain steps of setting up the environment and and running the code with certain parameters. If you can run tell the computer to run these, then you can become the foreman of the computer. You can just let it do the job on the background and you don't have to think about it anymore. And that's the idea of the serial job of moving from this interactive way of like, okay, I will have my IDE open. I will have my window open. I will run the code myself. 
and, and run the programs myself, Sli- moving towards codifying, codifying that workflow of, okay, I will choose this environment, I will choose these, um, these code pieces, and I will run it with these resources, and I will run these programs. And that way, uh, you can easily share it with other people, and you can do it non-interactively, where you don't have to wait for the resources, or wait for the results, uh, like just stare at the screen. You don't have to wait for your computer to, like, like one of my friends uh, when he was doing his uh, one of his theses, he basically kept his computer on all the time, <laughs> and it was like shouting in the next room because he needed to do the calculations. And yeah. that's not something you necessarily want to do yeah. because let's say your computer crashes and you want to use the browser or something mm-hmm. and uh, the computer is working yeah. on the background and it's annoying you. That's something that yeah. that using non-interactive work on the cluster helps you with yeah. because you can just push it to the cluster and put it there and it will run for you uh, yeah. those instructions that you gave it to, to do. Yeah, and my equivalent of your analogy is when one of my supervisors came to my office and got everyone in the group together and said, okay, I need us to run something. So you you run this code with these parameters, you run it with these parameters and so on and send me all the results. So that leads exactly to our next step, which is array jobs. So should we head there? Yes, yes, but, but like, yeah, yeah, we should. We should move towards it. So, so, but basically, try to. Uh, of course, in in a, like when you're developing code and everything like that, and you need the results immediately, it's usually a good idea to maybe do it on VDI or on your own laptop mm-hmm. or anything mm-hmm. like that, on a small scale uh, experiment to see that the code works, like the algorithm starts to move at the correct direction. Mm-hmm. But let's say you want to run the same algorithm for a longer time for bigger resources, bigger data sets then it's a good idea to uh, mm-hmm. start moving towards the non-interactive use in Triton. So it's it's like a gradient from interactive to non-interactive. And what we're going to be talking next, the array jobs, that's basically the production ready, where you want to scale your stuff up. You want to run it with big data, big mm-hmm. number of parameters. You want to get lots of things done with minimal amount of code. Yeah. So, um, should we go on? Yeah, let's look at the array jobs then.